Hi, in this video I wanted to talk about this lighting project which I'm developing for my house. And the situation is in this uh, particular instance of the bedroom uh, that we've got a series of down lights around the room, a centre light um, and then a, a bedside light each side of the bed. Um, and I wanted these lights on dimmer switches, but the problem with dimmer switches is you have a, a dimmer switch like this and you can only install this in one position. So you can't have, at least with the standard dimmer switches that you can buy, you can't have um, multiple controls of the brightness of the lights. So then you get, end up going down quite an expensive route of going for dimmers that have master and slave control and they never really work all that well. Um, there are some much more expensive commercial solutions, but they are um, you know, priced accordingly, so they are really expensive. Um, and there also are some home automation systems, but they don't quite work in the way that I'm wanting to, and they do sort of um, force you upon using certain faceplates uh, that work with their system. So the idea is that we're going to use um, some normal type switches. So um, in the house, mainly, I've got the MK grid system um, installed so um, you know you buy your modules like these um, they fit into the the grid uh, and then you can buy a faceplate that goes over the top um, in whatever color and lots of different styles um, but it means that you can put together uh, quite a customizable series of switches depending on um, what you need for that particular application and for the bedroom I'm thinking of using these uh, retractive switches so what these are are effectively um, a rocker switch with a centre off position. So we can use this to hold the button and, and dim the lights up or press it down to dim the lights down. Um, and then, you know, you tap it down to turn off the lights or something like that. But what this means is that um, you don't have to use rotary encoders. And in the case of dimmer switches where there's a potentiometer, um, you know, it doesn't matter if you change the brightness at one switch or another switch. Um, with the up-down control because um, we can just wire these in parallel um, and, and have individual control of the lights. And depending on how the project goes, it may end up being a little bit more elaborate whereby, for example, um, just with two switches by the bed, you could control uh, one lamp or both lamps or, or all of the ceiling lights depending on how you tap the switch. But uh, we'll see how that works out and whether it's usable. Um, but overall, what, we're, what I'm planning is to have a system that's quite modular, um, probably with some kind of mainboard or something, which allows you to have four different lighting channels uh, and then four separate switch inputs. And then it'll be down to the firmware on the board to um, work out how those switch inputs get used. And so the kind of modules I'm thinking of are um, some kind of mains dimmer for standard lamps because I don't want to go down the route of having everything custom. I do want these lamps to be standard lamps that you can replace the lamp on and everything like that. So um, still, you know, following normal wiring standards. Um, and then a system where we've got just a, a relay switch um, and then something for DC lighting. So either PWM control or constant current lighting uh, and then for switch inputs. So this is the overall concept where we've got some kind of uh, main board uh, with a microcontroller on it responsible for controlling everything. Uh, we've got the switch inputs at the bottom here um, and then we've got four modules that we can plug in. So these will be uh, individual PCBs uh, with a standard format and some pins at one end and you know maybe some screws at the other end to hold it in place. Uh, but the idea is that you could have for example four uh, dimmers or you could have four relay modules or a mix of any of these types of things. So um, yeah, we, one way you can accept mains in and drive standard mains lamps, a PWM driver where you can um, put DC in and drive LED strips or something like that, a constant current driver where again you put DC in but it, it uh, controls LEDs without any driver um, or current limiting. So you know you can set 350 milliamps and drive normal one watt LEDs. And then finally a relay module for turning things on and off. For example, um, the fan in the bathroom uh, would be an example. So I thought what we'd do in this video is have a little look at some of the circuit aspects of the design. Uh, and then in the next video, we should have some um, prototype PCBs uh, to start experimenting a little bit with the design. Um, to start with, we'll look at the input channel. So for the primary control of these lights, I do want to use just standard accessories that uh, we would normally use in the house so that it's familiar and doesn't need anything custom. So most of the lights um, in my house are already controlled by uh, grid switch modules, so I want to keep that form 
form factor um, and the style of those. So I use the MK Logic ones. Some of them are grey, some of them are white, some of them are shiny ones, but they all accept um, you know, the same accessories. Um, and there's a few considerations to designing that circuit. Um, because this is going to be used in a domestic environment and there's going to be long lengths of cable, these cables act very well like antennas and if you simply just tied this, uh, the switch to your circuit 3.3 volts and the other end to your GPIO, it would be really susceptible to noise and transients. So, um, you know, you could imagine someone turns on a vacuum cleaner or um, some other high current using device and this cable that acts like an antenna would just pick up a little transient and that could be enough uh, with the high circuit impedance of your GPIO to turn on the lights in your room, which is sort of the last thing you want. So I was looking at three different options for improving the immunity and obviously um, something like relays gives you the highest immunity. You need quite a lot of current to drive the relay coil. Um, so you'd sort of have this side of the circuit on uh, an unregulated 24 volt or 12 volt supply or something like that. Um, but with this, there's no way you'd get a transient large enough to trigger the relay coil. And then this side would run on your 3.3 volt logic into the microcontroller and can just be a standard um, you know, arrangement like this where you've got uh, a pull down resistor and a little RC circuit for um, debouncing the switch. Um, obviously this is fine, P PCB relays are relatively inexpensive but um, they do take up space. Um, but this is certainly one option. Another option would be to um, drive a transistor input with your switch. Um, you've got to be a little bit careful with the design here because uh, firstly you don't want to wreck your transistor with any transients so actually uh, what I've emitted from here is probably some kind of zener diode or something to um, protect uh, the base from transients. Um, but the main thing that you want to do because you don't need very much current to turn on a transistor is force quite a lot of current through the switch um, so that any small currents that are induced or coupled in from nearby wiring um, don't automatically trigger that transistor. So, uh, you know, you could come up with an arrangement here where you've got a series of resistors uh, forcing sort of 10 milliamps or uh, more through the switch um, and then sort of any low level currents that are coupled in would automatically be um, directed to circuit zero volts here and not turn on the transistor. Uh, and then you could come up with an arrangement here where you have a zener or a, a diode to increase the forward um, turn on voltage of this transistor um, just so that it's not turning on if there's just a little uh, event on the wires here. So that's certainly another option that we could consider. And then the other one that I've considered is uh, an opto-coupled input. Uh, and a similar affair really, you do need uh, a reasonable amount of current to turn on an LED. Um, therefore it's quite a safe circuit to assume that you're not going to see much in the way of transients affecting your circuit. But again you could come up with the same arrangement where you force some current through the switch and divert it straight to ground so that uh, nearby electrical wiring um, doesn't start building up enough voltage to turn on this LED. And again, you could add something like a Zener diode here um, to increase the, the point where that LED would turn on. So for example, I've illustrated here a 5.1 volt Zener. Therefore, the voltage at this point would need to be uh, over six volts in order to turn on the LED, which seems you know, like a fairly reasonable uh, way of doing things. And then, um, like I said with this here, we've just got some reverse voltage protection just to make sure any transients don't wreck the LED. So I think out of these three options, I'm going to choose a solid state option uh, just for reliability. And then uh, out of these two, I think the opto coupled input seems the most sensible. It just feels a little bit dodgy having um, you know, a semiconductor device that's connected to your main circuit with part of its element exposed to um, you know, transients and other things in the house. So um, I think we'll look at this uh, opto coupled input in more detail in the next video. So your traditional dimmer switch uses leading edge phase control. So what that means is you've got this um, triac in here, which can be triggered to turn on at any point in the AC waveform, uh, and it stays latched on until it passes through the zero crossing point. So for example here, uh, we've got an AC waveform here uh, in black, so that's our voltage waveform. And in order to achieve 50% uh, power, I've written brightness, but actually um, it never is because uh, the lamps aren't linear. But to achieve 50% power through the lamp, uh, what you would do is you would trigger the gate halfway through the waveform uh, and it would turn on at this point, Follow the current would follow the, um, the voltage waveform in the case of a resistive load, 
uh, and then it would switch off once it goes through the zero crossing point. And again, your dimmer switch would turn it back on halfway through the negative cycle, uh, and it would stay on for that period until it goes again through the zero crossing point. And you can change the brightness of the lamp by changing the point at which you trigger the gate. So the more you um, trigger the gate to the left-hand side, so the earlier in the AC waveform, the brighter the lamp is, uh, and obviously uh, vice versa. So the later you turn it on, the dimmer the lamp is. And these circuits are fine for resistive loads, and they're actually fine for inductive loads like motors. But if you drive a capacitive load, uh, which is typically how an LED lamp would represent itself, what you see is very high transient currents because um, the capacitor wants to charge up as fast as it can. And if you turn uh, the power on to a, um, a capacitor at the highest point in the AC waveform, for example, um, it's going to try and dump loads and loads of power. It will appear like a short circuit uh, until the capacitor charges up and then um, you know the current will die down. So what you see is big high transient currents and either that destroys your dimmer switch or it will destroy the circuit um, in the LED lamp that's connected to it. So you really can't use a standard um, leading edge dimmer. What you have to design is a circuit um, called a trailing edge dimmer whereby you turn on the, um, the current to the lamp and then turn it off mid waveform. And you can imagine with the capacitor that's fine capacitor's charged up and then you disconnect the power and it discharges and the lamp goes out for that part of the waveform. If you did this with an inductive load, uh, you'd have the opposite problem. So the inductor would try and keep conducting. You'd see a really high voltage develop and then it would dump all of its um, current through the switching device and destroy the dimmer. So you do have to make sure that you use the correct dimmer switch for the correct application. Um, but what this means is you can't use a triac based circuit because you can't turn off the triac uh, mid waveform. It has to go through the zero crossing point in order to turn it off. So when you buy a dimmer switch in the UK uh, and probably in most other countries, you tend to end up with some kind of module like this. Um, it's either a grid module like this or, or it's mounted on a faceplate, but it's still a module um, you know, with the same kind of form factor behind the faceplate. Um, and you don't traditionally have the neutral available at the switch, so it ends up getting wired in series with the phase conductor like a normal switch would be. But what it means is that the electronics within this has to steal some of its power um, from the lamp. And um, you know the other side effect is that um, depending on the dimmer switch that you use, um, it will need a certain amount of current to flow through the lamp before the electronics is functional, which is why you'll often see on some dimmer switches uh, that it can't be used with a load less than 40 watts, for example, because um, if you're using a load less than that, it, there is not enough current available to drive the electronics. Um, but yeah, it limits the maximum brightness through the lamp, um, and you can never get 100% brightness because you can't turn on your transistor device uh, without stealing some of the power from the, uh, from the light. The other option is um, having um, a neutral available, which means that you can have a little power supply within your dimmer switch, and then you've got full control of the light, um, and you don't ever have to um, rely on any parasitic current going through the light to run your circuit. So since this is going to be a somewhat custom installation, and the uh, electronics isn't going to be placed within the, um, the switch um, position, uh, I am going to have a neutral available. So we're going to go through this uh, with this method. So basically what we need to design is a solid state relay type circuit and there's lots of ways that you can design this. I've illustrated two here using MOSFETs but um, you can use any sort of transistor device really. So you could use IGBTs, uh, potentially you could use bipolar transistors if you came up with the correct arrangement. Uh, but we do want to keep losses fairly low um, so that we don't have to have heat sinks and that kind of thing. So one of the SSR type circuits which I'm drawing here uh, is quite neat in that it only needs one MOSFET to control AC and it does that with the use of a bridge rectifier. And I've drawn the, the two paths for the AC waveform. Obviously when the MOSFET's turned off uh, you've got your current going through here and it gets to this point and then there's no current flow through the MOSFET so nothing happens. But um, on one side of the AC waveform when the MOSFET's on it goes through this diode here, through the MOSFET, through this other diode in the bridge rectifier and through to your load so the light turns on. And on the opposite side of the waveform it goes the opposite way, goes, follows the green line here through this diode up here, through the MOSFET again in the same direction, uh, and then 
out through this diode through the bridge rectifier and into your phase conductor. So this is quite neat in that it only needs a MOSFET um, to control AC. The downside is that there are quite a few losses in the circuit. So these um, diodes are going to have a voltage drop, you know, 0.6 to 1 volt or something like that. Uh, and if you were drawing 1 amp from the mains, um, you're going to be dissipating um, 1.2 watts in your bridge rectifier if the lamp's on at full power. So obviously we're dissipating quite a bit of power. Um, so I thought we'd follow something a little bit more like a traditional SSR circuit um, where we've got two back-to-back n-channel -back, uh, MOSFETs with the sources tied together and the gates um, tied together. Um, and when the driver is turned off, um, there's no current flow through either of the body diodes and obviously the two MOSFETs are turned off um, so there's no current flow through to your lamp. But when you develop a suitable gate source voltage um, with your driver, uh, the MOSFET will actually conduct current in any direction, um, so you just get current flow through both of these MOSFETs and through to your lamp. And obviously, because it's not, uh, it doesn't act like a triac, you can turn these MOSFETs on and off as much as you want within the AC waveform and control the brightness exactly as you would like for your lamp and, um, you know, in the correct waveform so that you don't damage your transistors or damage your lamp. So I thought we'd have a look at what some of the waveforms look like in real life. So we've got the oscilloscope hooked up to the output of this dimmer switch um, and we've got a GU10 halogen lamp and this dimmer module does have some electronics in it to soft start the load um, because these halogen lamps do have a very low resistance when they're cold and they're susceptible to going bang and blowing your dimmer switch up. So this one has some electronics in here um, but if we turn on the power to it you can see the lamps just turned on slightly and we can see um, exactly what I illustrated um, before. So um, for the very low intensity you can see here that um, the dimmer is turned on partway through the AC waveform and um, you know the, the lamps only on for a short period of time. If we start increasing the brightness you can see we get more and more of the AC waveform through. Um, and you can see here, this is the maximum brightness and this is what I was talking about. You do need to use some of the power available to power the electronics inside the unit. So we don't ever get the full AC waveform. Um, you get this bit here where the lamp isn't on um, because it has to uh, trigger the triac. So the voltage has to rise to a certain point in order to be able to turn on the switching device. Um, and you also need that power to power the electronics. So, um, so this is what it looks like driving a standard halogen load. Um, it might be interesting to see what it looks like if we drive something that it's not intended to drive. Um, so that would be a LED uh, GU10 lamp. Right, so what we've got in the lamp holder now is a lap branded uh, dimmable LED lamp. It's rated for about 5 watts. Um, so let's see what the waveform and the behaviour is. Right, so you saw there during the soft start it came on quite dim and then jumped up to this brightness. So this is actually the minimum brightness and it is actually uh, really quite bright um, even though it's only on for quite a small amount of the AC waveform. If we take up the brightness we have got smooth dimming the whole way uh, but that minimum brightness is quite, um, quite high still uh, and I don't know whether that's down to this particular dimmer uh, but we did see uh, during the soft start it was able to light up at a much dimmer brightness. So what we've got here is a very similar module, it's got a slightly different part number and you can see this one is designed for LED lamps but what I found with this uh, dimmer switch when I tried it in the lounge it was driving 10 um, LEDs but I found this to cause the lamps to flicker quite a lot. So what we've got this time is the LED dimmer here um, and then I've also added a current clamp. Unfortunately it's uh, not really suitable for reading sort of milliamps and that kind of thing. It's a uh, a 20 amp range uh, clamp meter uh, but it should give us a flavor for what's going on. Um, so the blue line on here is going to be the current waveform. Um, the scale's incorrect, I haven't set it up properly uh, but it'll give us an idea of what it's looking like and then the yellow waveform is the voltage. So let's turn on the output. So you can see here uh, if I zoom in slightly the blue one's the current waveform and you can see you get that big spike in current as it turns on and then it dwindles off towards, um, towards zero again. 
and then if we start increasing the brightness that waveform doesn't actually change that much um, which indicates that this is a really big inrush current that's uh, being conducted through the lamp and then the operating current is actually uh, much lower. So uh, what I might do in a moment is just eliminate the dimmer and we can have a look what the current waveform looks like if we power the lamp directly from the mains. Um, but while we've got this set up we may as well have a look what the current waveform looks like with the uh, halogen GU10. And with the halogen lamp what you can see here is firstly that the current's much higher. This is set to the minimum brightness and you can see um, the lamp is a lot dimmer. Uh, but also the waveform follows the AC voltage waveform a lot, lo a lot more closely. So uh, yeah, the blue one's the current. And as we increase the brightness, you can see it um, starting to follow the, the waveform rather than just seeing that big pulse of current and then it dropping down to almost nothing. Um, we do see a change in shape on the waveform. Um, so actually the, the current here, the peak current here is a little bit higher. Um, and that's partly to do with the fact that uh, when the lamp is cool, um, the resistance is a little bit lower, so you see more current going through the filament for that short period of time. So we are so seeing some thermal effects of the filament. Um, what we're also seeing is a little bit of a shift of the waveform because this dimmer switch has uh, that large inductor in it. Um, so actually uh, we're seeing a shift in the current uh, waveform in comparison to the voltage waveform. Um, but yeah, you can see um, in comparison the the LED lamp had that high inrush current which was causing a big spike at the beginning uh, and then it went down to almost nothing. So what we'll do now is we'll just take the dimmer switch out of the equation and just see what the waveform looks like for this LED lamp. Right so now we've got the dimmer switch out of the equation we're just powering the lamp directly. If we turn on the power um, what you can see here on the oscilloscope now is we've got the voltage waveform going up and down but there's no big peaks in current like there were before. Um, you can just see a, a small amount of inrush as the capacitor charging up and then it basically dwindles down to nothing. But we were seeing uh, much higher currents when we, when we were turning on part of the way through the waveform. Um, so that is something that we do want to eliminate because that is stressing uh, both the lamp and obviously the, uh, the dimmer switch is seeing some very high peak currents. And you know, imagine you've got 10 of these lamps in your circuit, you're going to see some really big uh, currents forming, uh, which is why they always specify a much lower wattage uh, limit for LED lamps. You know, it says on the says on here four to seventy watts for the LED lamps, but it can actually drive two hundred and twenty watts because of that uh, capacitive aspect. And if you buy uh, a dimmer switch from um, a brand like um, Very Light VPro, they say maximum of ten lamps uh, because of the same reason. Really, you see that uh, relatively high inrush current. So I've drawn up a schematic and also a PCB um, so that in the next video what we can do is we can start testing out the trailing edge dimmer uh, with some loads. Um, so we've got test points everywhere so that we can put the uh, oscilloscope probes in and have a look at the waveforms. Um, the, this part of the, the schematic is hopefully as it will be in the final design. So we've got some of the components in there for extra protection. So we've got a MOV, we've got a snubber network for suppression on some of the uh, switching edges. Um, we've got a diode here, a Zener diode to um, protect the gate on these MOSFETs from seeing an excessive voltage. Uh, and then we've got an opto-coupled gate driver for driving uh, these MOSFETs so that we can control this safely from our microcontroller. Uh, we're going to be using one of those DC to DC modules to obtain isolation for driving uh, you know this part of the circuit because um, when we do the analysis this is going to be bouncing all over the place um, so we can't just derive it straight off the main supply um, we need a, an isolated converter and then also in order to actually drive um, the waveform correctly we need to work out where the zero, zero crossing point is on the AC waveform um, I have um, added in a little bit of electronics here for that so we're just using a standard uh, arrangement with a bridge rectifier and an opto coupler uh, and I have done a little bit of analysis here just to work out um, what would happen with that circuit um, so with our 50 hertz sine wave uh, we'll get little pulses um, of 46.8 microseconds approximately uh, which should be enough to trigger our microcontroller the downside with this circuit is we're burning um, sort of 1.2 watts RMS um, because we've just got um, a resistive dropper driving that LED. So um, in the final circuit I probably won't implement this circuit as it is 
Um, it may be that this gets driven from a transformer output or we try and couple it in capacitively from the uh, incoming cable, but we'll have a look at uh, that in another video. Um, so yeah, I've designed some PCBs, this is part of it. Um, so this is the, the dimmer prototype board. Um, so you can see here we've got our isolation slot and um, you know we've got these test points here that we can connect our oscilloscope to. I've also done uh, a little dev board um, for us to prototype a potential microcontroller um, so that the software that I write isn't wasted. Um, so those are with JLC PCB now. Um, hopefully we should have those in about a week or so and um, we'll be able to um, explore this circuit a little bit further. So sorry that video was a little bit dry but it's uh, a bit of documentation and understanding of the uh, design principles. In the next video we'll get down and dirty with the oscilloscope and the circuit and have a look at how it all works properly and try some practical things. So well done if you managed to sit through the whole video. Uh, yeah like I said next time it should be a bit more exciting. But until next time, thanks for watching.